Today on Fresno State Focus, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump went head-to-head -head in the first presidential debate of the 2016 election. Find out which candidate most Fresno State students support. Plus, the Central Valley Honor Flight traveled to Washington, D.C. for the 11th time. What some of the veterans experienced and how they were recognized. And last year's Rookie of the Year at the Rodeo College National Finals is back at it again. What she hopes to accomplish this season with the Fresno State Rodeo team. Fresno State Focus starts now. Hello and welcome to Fresno State Focus. I'm Julie Cruz. And I'm Jenna Cliff. The first 2016 presidential debate between Democrat Hillary Clinton and Republican Donald Trump was on Monday. ASI held a viewing party for students in the University Student Union. About 130 people attended the event. After the debate was over, students took part in a discussion on who they thought was the better candidate. They also had the opportunity to register to vote. One of the questions that sparked attention during the debate was why Clinton deleted the 33,000 emails. I was kind of like, boo, like maybe that's not the most important thing to be talking about in the debate today. So I think little things like that were really what kind of sparked the crowd today. CNN says their voter poll shows Clinton won the debate 62% to Trump's 27%, but more Democrats may have responded. The morning crew from B95 Radio has teamed up with ASI for their student tailgates this season. You can find Carmen and DJ John Magic tabling at the ASI tailgate. ASI wanted to reach out to the students and what better way than with teaming up with some radio DJ favorites. Just meeting the students, we love uh, meeting the listeners, uh, everyone that listens to, the, to our morning show because I'm part of the morning show and the whole station really so just meeting people, super fun. B95 plans on giving out Fresno State tickets at every tailgate, like the Big Fresno Fair tickets, Jason Derulo tickets, and much more. Any student can stop by the tailgate as long as they have their student ID on them. The tailgate is located in the red lot at spot 57. Students can also help themselves to free food, drinks, and candy. A group of World War II and Korean War veterans had the chance to take one more tour with honor. A little over two weeks ago, I traveled with the Central Valley Honor Flight to Washington, D.C. for the experience of a lifetime. Hey, it's a great morning. <laughs> this is the best morning. Honor Flight morning. Central Valley Honor Early Flight President Al Perry is rallying the troops. 64 World War II and Korean War veterans are preparing for a trip to Washington, D.C. We haven't fought yet, but <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Martin Cortez and his guardian Patty Fenton met two weeks ago. Before the next three days, they'll be best friends. I want to just make this a phenomenal flight for Mr. Cortez and something he will remember for the rest of his life. Cortez served in the Army during the Korean War. He thought he was going to the North Pacific. Then I was dismayed when I graduated from artillery to find out I wasn't going to Korea, I was going to Germany. <laughs> and then somehow, the things got messed up, and when I boarded a board ship, they dropped me off in England. <laughs> Cortez spent his tour there working in communications. Now, 65 years later, he's visiting the war memorials with other Korean and World War II veterans. Memorials that were built in their honor. This is the 11th Central Valley Honor Flight. This organization has brought hundreds of veterans here to Washington, D.C to see these memorials. By the end of this trip, every single veteran leaves feeling more appreciated than ever before. David Kroll was awarded the Silver Star for bravery. He risked his life to rescue a pilot who had been captured by the enemy during the Korean War. Because of their courageous acts in the service, Kroll and Sam Australian had the privilege of laying a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. Kroll credits Central Valley Honor Flight President Al Perry. Present. 
There's nobody that can duplicate what he's done for the veterans. But what our veterans have done for us and our country is even greater. Tiffany Heyer says she's lucky she met Kroll and feels privileged to have been his guardian. She says it was an honor to visit D.C. for the first time with a member of the greatest generation. These guys and gals put their life on the line for us and they didn't question it. And today I think a lot of people would question what they do or what they would do. And you know, the generation that served stepped up without question and without any regard for their own safety. Joining us is the person who actually brought the honor flight to the Central Valley, Paul Leffler. Thanks for being here today. Um, so Tiffany says it pretty well. These men and women put their life on the line and they didn't question it. What do you think these vets feel being able to go to these memorials? Well, you were there. You saw it. You saw the tears. You saw the goosebumps. You felt the goosebumps. It's so powerful for them to go there and realize this is built for them. And this is the way our country says thank you to those who have put their lives on the line, who have paid for our freedom. And it's so neat to see those cross-generational connections formed where younger people like yourself get to meet these folks so much older than you and see they did what they did. Why was it so important for you to bring the honor of light to the Central Valley? Well, I'm just a little part of a big team of volunteers. We're all volunteers, but it was important because if we didn't do this, so many veterans wouldn't have a chance to see the memorial built for them. It was too late for a lot of them to go on their own. So by the community rallying together and supporting this, we've been able to take over 700 veterans to see their memorials. We've got another one going October 24th, and hopefully we can keep this going as long as there are veterans who haven't had that chance. So for the flights in the past and the future flights, um, you guys obviously need a, a lot of guardians. I know some are family members, some mm -hmm. are sons, daughters, um, but some people are volunteers. Right. So how do you guys keep people wanting to volunteer? Well, I think when they see this on the news, they see your story, they say, wow, that's incredible. We have people coming from all over. In fact, sometimes we have more volunteers than we can put on a plane. Um, but I think when people recognize what these men and women did for us, they're lining up to be a part of it. And for a lot of folks who maybe they lost their dad or their grandpa or their uncle, it's a way for them to connect to him through another veteran. And it's really, really powerful. So while, we're, while the vets and guardians are there at the honor flight, what role do the guardians play in this? So each veteran has a guardian, and uh, some veterans don't want a guardian. They don't want someone watch them everywhere they go and staying arm's length away, but it's important for safety reasons. When you're talking about an average age of over 90 on these trips, in many cases, uh, we need someone there to watch them, to push a wheelchair, to make sure they get in and out of a bus, and really to share the experience with them. And it's so neat to see the veterans share that experience with each other and also with family members and the volunteer guardians who show up. Uh, everyone comes away saying this was a life-changing experience. So Honor Flight number 12 is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, what, what else do you guys need for this? Well, what we need is for people to show up at the airport on October 26th. We're going to have a big party there. If you've never been before, it's the best thing in Fresno, I say. It brings everybody together behind a common cause. So be there the night of the 26th, about 5.30 or so. And, of course, we need donations to keep this going. Every single penny that people give goes to taking veterans to their memorial. No one gets paid for this. It's all volunteers. So every penny you give really does make a difference. And as long as people continue to give, we'll keep taking these flights. Are there going to be any more flights after the 12th? We're sure hoping that in 2017 we can take at least a couple flights. And the, the other thing that people can do is tell the veteran in their life. If you haven't done this yet, if you haven't applied, it's free. What are you waiting for? CVHonorFlight.org. You go there, you can fill it out right online and get those vets signed up. Great. We've been talking with Paul Leffler with the Central Valley Honor Flight. Thank you, Paul. You bet. We're in the process of putting together a half-hour documentary that will air on November 9th featuring the stories of many more veterans who went on the Honor Flight number 11. The Central Valley Honor Flight will be taking one more group of veterans to D.C. for trip number 12. You can still donate at cvhonorflight.org and remember that no donation is too small. Pressure to find a job after college is tough, but some Fresno State students are one step ahead. They attended the Excellence in Journalism Conference in New Orleans last week. Liz Juarez is an, tells us why this is an eye-opening experience. The of the trial. Student and professional journalists are learning how to cover mass murders with integrity. The murderer who uh, 
um, killed my son and shot 70 other people and six-year-old girl. Tom Teves shared his grief and hopes that journalists learn to be more sensitive when covering crime stories. More than 100 students attended the conference to learn how to improve their skills. The state students were able to enjoy some really great opportunities this week by joining the Excellence in Journalism Conference in New Orleans. Yeah, which one? Really good. Yeah. Multimedia senior Sierra Downey was excited that Native American journalists were part of the conference. As you know, they have Nausea for the first time, partnered with EIJ and um, SPJ. So we're getting a lot of outside information that wasn't coming in, I think, last year. And I'm really appreciative of that, personally. Downey is working on a radio documentary on Native Americans, and the connections she made were extremely valuable to her. We'll see, man. I'm optimistic about my future. University of Texas student Jesse Diamba was part of the EIJ newsroom, a group of students from across the country who covered the conference. You need to know how to talk to people. If you don't, just put yourself out there. Just go, hey, how's it going? Look them in the eyes. Apart from socializing and attending workshops, students had some downtime and enjoyed a live jazz show hosted by CNN at the House of Blues. When they weren't playing, they were working. Organizer Karen Hansen says there's something for everyone. We try really hard to have things that appeal to students, to new pros, to people at all different levels and in all different mediums. Conferences like this help give aspiring young journalists a chance to grow and become the storytellers they have always wanted to be. Ms. Suarez, Fresno State Focus. Two Fresno State students were part of a news team that covered the conference for the Society of Professional Journalists. Jordan Kemp and Natalie Ney competed against students around the country for a spot on the 14-student news team. Their stories were published on the EIJ News website and were read by hundreds of conference attendees. And as young journalists, we can sometimes get things wrong or do things incorrectly and it can really offend some people. And so I got to take away a lot of experience in knowing that when I did cover these issues and I did cover these panels as part of the EIJ News team, I did it correctly and I'm going to be able to do that for the rest of my life. One of the many benefits included full access to all of the events and newsmakers who attended the conference. Students had one-on-one -on -one conversations with nationally known journalists Charlie Rose and Marty Barron. That's pretty awesome. They got to meet all these professionals and it was, seems like it was pretty competitive for a 14 student news team. Yeah, I agree. It seems like that will really help them in their future and that's definitely a great resume builder. It is. Coming up on Fresno State Focus, we'll preview tonight's President's Forum of Inclusion, Respect and Equity with keynote speaker Dr. David Pilgrim. But first, Garth Brooks rocked the Safe Mart Center all weekend. We'll take you back safe with the country legend. Fresno State, forming relationships and learning experiences that last a lifetime. Making friends who are like family, learning from professors who treat us like family, and earning a degree to make a better future for our family. Engaging our alumni generation by generation by generation. This is our Fresno State. Welcome to the family. Success. Success. At Fresno State, it's no secret. It's discovering new ways to change our world. It's creating opportunities as diverse as our community itself. It's in the distinction of our graduates as they lead us into the future. Success is no secret at Fresno State. It's our mission. The sound of fans screaming was deafening inside the Save Mart Center, and Garth Brooks loved it. Brooks played a few tunes from his most recent album, Man Against Machine. And he performed lots of old songs that had fans singing along. Brooks and his wife Trisha Yearwood sang a couple duets, and then Yearwood did her own set, 
including a tribute to breast cancer survivors in honor of her mother who died from the disease. On Friday, before the first concert, Brooks and Yearwood met with the media to talk about the tour and coming out of a 14-year retirement. I, I will say on this tour, I feel a thousand times more grateful than I did in the 90s. I don't feel like I took the 90s for granted, but whatever this feeling is, and it must be just this late in your career, having a run like we're getting to have right now, I'm very grateful for that. DJ Greg Lane has met Brooks several times and admires him for his down-to-earth persona. I think the thing that blows me away is how many, when, when somebody remembers you, I mean, how many millions of people does this guy meet? How many millions of districts, and, and you have a connection, and, and that means a lot. Buddy, thank you. Brooks also invited student media to the news conference. Collegian reporter Jenna Wilson couldn't believe her luck. Oh, I felt like I was going to throw up because I was so nervous meeting Garth Brooks and Trisha Yearwood. Um, I'm a huge fan. Even though I'm 21, like I grew up on country music and it's in my family and um, it just, it really does move me. Even listening to the music this morning, I felt like I was going to cry. Wilson also attended the concert as Brooks' guest. In this case, an answered prayer. Natalie Nigg. Fresno State Focus. And that was Natalie Nig reporting. Thank you, Natalie. Big news for this week um, for, for Garth Brooks. Friday during the concert, Yearwood announced that the country star has achieved seven Diamond Awards for albums that have sold more than 10 million copies each. If you're looking for fun this fall semester, why not go experience the creative minds of dance students? Fresno State's University Theater class will be hosting a performance that they choreographed and taught each other within 12 hours of class time. Students say the class was stressful, but they're excited to show off what they've pulled through under pressure. They're, they also hope to recruit more students for future productions. Catch the show on opening night, November 17th in Lab School 101 at 8 p.m. Pokemon Go is sweeping the country and has made its way to Fresno State. It's a perfect pastime for the Geeks, Geeks and Gamers Club on campus. There are Pokemon just about everywhere you turn, around every corner, and in some rather surprising places. The craziest place I found a Pokemon, I don't even know. And the craziest place I have found a Pokemon so far um, would have to be behind uh, where I work, next to an ice cream parlor. Released in early July, the game has been downloaded more than 500 million times. Pokemon Go users spend an estimated 26 minutes of their day playing the game. And that's a look at your entertainment news. Back to you, Jenna. Thanks, Bree. The President's Forum on Inclusion, Respect, and Equity takes place in the Henry Madden Library tonight at 7. The keynote speaker is Dr. David Pilgrim, director of the Jim Crow Museum in Big Rapids, Michigan. Dr. Pilgrim joins us with more on tonight's event. Hi, Dr. Pilgrim, thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about the event tonight? Well, I'm gonna discuss the museum, how it was founded, but mainly I'm gonna emphasize uh, the way objects are used to divide people. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And so what is the message that you really hope to convey tonight? Well, if you look at the museum, which has about uh, 10, 15,000 objects. It's hard to know because we're still inventorying. There are no objects that were made in the past that are not being made today. What that says to me is, is that despite the fact that America is more democratic and more egalitarian than it has ever been, uh, we still have a ways to go as a nation. I believe that and know to be true that you can take an object, even a contemptible object, and you can use it to teach, uh, some people don't like the word tolerance, but you can use it to teach tolerance and you can use it to teach social justice. And you also recently wrote a book. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, the book is, uh, you know, it's about the history of stereotypes and caricatures, but it's also about my journey. Uh, the first piece I, I bought, I broke. I did not break the second piece or the third. Um, and so it talks about my relationship to those pieces. And so it's about me as a garbage collector. And how did you get started with the Jim Crow Museum? Well, you know, I grew up in the, in the Deep South. Uh, when you left my house, you were in the water, so it was that deep, <laughs> that southern. And uh, the objects were everywhere. I went to historically black college, um, you know, thought about, talked about, learned about race. And at some point in my life, uh, it sort of clicked that these objects could be used to teach those stories. 
So these objects have a lot of meaning to you? Absolutely. Um, you know, although I've often said they either belong in a museum or they belong in a garbage can. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting that they are in the museum. That is very neat. And then is there a specific reason that you came to this campus? Well, uh, I believe that or not, Fresno is on my bucket list. Uh, <laughs> I actually have a really long bucket list. Um, but I, I, I do a lot of travel. I, I, because of the museum and my work, I, I often get an opportunity to go to different college campuses. Uh, it also, I'm also a vice president of diversity and inclusion, so it allows me to understand the way different institutions are, are doing the work that they're doing and to compare notes. And so I'm hoping to learn here uh, from, from my day job. <laughs> and then do you think that it's critical to come to college campuses? Oh, absolutely. Um, I want to say something corny like uh, the young people are the future of the world. <laughs> uh, and so I'll say something corny, the young people are the future of the world. And um, I don't know how much longer I have, but the time I do have, I want to spend it listening to and talking to young people, uh, again, about my journey. One last thing, I don't tell people what to believe, but I do share with them what I believe. Well, I hope that you have a good luck at your event tonight. We've been talking with Dr. David Pilgrim, Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at Ferris State University in Michigan. The President's Forum on Inclusion, Respect and Equity takes place on the third floor of the Henry Madden Library tonight at 7. Coming up in sports, a story of determination. How one girl isn't letting a birth defect stop her from playing the sports she loves. Stay tuned with sports with Grecia Sanchez. I got the ball that's for you. Up in my head. Up in my head. Up in my head. I got that ball that's spirit. Up in my head. Up in my head to say. Welcome back. I'm Grecia Sanchez with your sports report. There are plenty of reasons why Mariah Mercer could stay on the sidelines, the most obvious being that she can't walk. But that hasn't kept her from taking the field for Series High School as a center for the Powder Puff football team. Mercer has spina bifida, a birth defect that causes nerve damage. She has a lesion on her spine where it was unconnected and relies on a bright pink wheelchair to get around. It's her second year playing, and while there are challenges, she's not concerned about them. The Fresno State football team season is in full effect, and with a familiar face back on the field. Joining us today is a defensive lineman for the Bulldogs, Kyle Hendrickson. Thanks for joining us today, Kyle. Thanks for having me. So you did a lot of plays last year, and you ended up suffering a season-ending knee injury. Can you take me back to that moment and how exactly it happened? Um, well, it was the last quarter of our last game, and I was starting to get into the, into the swing of things again. I was starting to learn the defense, and it was just one, one freak accident, planted wrong, had some weight pushed on me from the side, and felt a snap, and it was that dreaded, oh, it's my knee the cliche sports injury and almost immediately I knew it was something serious and I just it was a matter of time before they told me uh, you did tear your ACL. And how hard was it to do rehab and come back from tearing your ACL? It was definitely a, it was a character test. It, it, it definitely helped me build character and it was it, I couldn't have done it without the tremendous support from our strength, uh, strength staff, our sports medicine staff and just trainers that care beyond belief. And uh, I was blessed to have the surgery go extremely well. And our, like I said, our trainers were phenomenal. And even though I didn't want to rehab, which was a lot, I was in there and they were getting me back to where I needed to be. And it was only because of them and through dedication and hard work that I could come back and try and see the field again. 
So you were a redshirt freshman and you played a part of your sophomore season. How is it back? How is it to? How does it feel to be back um, with your teammates back in the field? That it's it's an unreal feeling because I've had to, I've been with the team, but when it comes to certain physical events, it was tough to just watch them from the sidelines. It was tough to not be able to go through that grind that every all my brothers had to do in the off season. I just had to sit there and watch and. It was good when I could finally start getting back into things and they could push me and tell me, okay, now you can run a little bit more and now you can squat a little bit more. And we just kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until eventually I could come back in. And when I first found out that I was cleared by my doctors and I could come back for my teammates, that I would, it was, it was un, unreal to be back on the field and it felt so good to put those cleats back on. All right, well, thank you so much, Kyle. We've been talking with Fresno State defensive lineman, Kyle Hendrickson. When heading out to support your Bulldogs this year, you may notice a few changes. The athletic facilities are now closed off, providing student athletes with security and safety. While student athlete safety was an important part of these changes, event operations say that they were actually designed with the fans in mind as well. Our long-term plan of Bulldog Stadium and expanding it. So it came as an athletic department as a whole. We're fundraising. It's probably a five-year plan or so. Um, the first phase is to add the fences and expand the footprint because we are going to be working on the east side, the north side, and the west side. These fences may be only a small part of the process, but they bring fans one step closer to a brand new football stadium. And Jenna, I hear the Fresno State Rodeo team is starting their season. What have they been up to? Well, Gracie, the Bulldoggers are back at it and they are ready for another year. Here's a preview of their accomplishments last year and where they hope to go this year. To some, this may look like a way of keeping people out. To Brittany Diaz, this is the entrance to her world. Diaz is a sophomore. She competes on the Fresno State Rodeo Team. Last year in the College National Finals, she led the team to its highest ever placing. They took 10th place overall, Diaz won reserve and was named Rookie of the Year. It's a little overwhelming, I'd say, coming in as a freshman, but I kind of just took it, um, just, just like every other rodeo. I'm like, I'm not going to put a whole lot of pressure on myself. So Teammate uh, Ryle Englehart uh, knew Diaz would do well at Nationals. When, when I heard that Brittany was doing so well at Nationals, it was no surprise because she is just a stud like that and does work all the time, so it was just... Very exciting to hear our team on the map. Diaz hopes to top that performance this year. For this year, I'd like to go back to the College National Finals Rodeo, um, hopefully leading the region like I was last year. Hopefully I'll come in and I'd like to take that national title. If you think Brittany Diaz does it alone, think again. It takes two to play this game. The relationship I have with my teammates, I have with my horse, if not more. Diaz sees her horse, Bo, as more than an animal. He's like family. Coach Tony Branquino has been a positive help for her and the team as they start a new year. My expectations are huge every year. I hope to win the region, to come away with women's all-around champion, win every event championship, go to nationals, and walk away as a national champion women's team. Coach Branquino and Diaz both hope this will be a great year for the Fresno State Rodeo team. To get to nationals this year, I hope to just do exactly what I did last year, practicing with the team, um, practicing as often as I can, as, as much as I can, without putting a whole lot of stress on myself and doing it with God by my side. Next week on the Fresno State Focus, a bullfighter who risks his life for the love of his job. Plus, local artist Z. Will talks about how he got started in music. And a family-owned creamery provides organic sweet treats to the Fresno community. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.